Okay guys, we are here and we are doing the civic literacy essay for unit 9. Uh, you are not actually writing this essay. All you're going to do is run through the documents. We're going to read them together and then we are going to outline the essay. Um, but you are not actually writing it. First, I want to start with looking at the question that we have here. So we want the historical circumstance, which we know means background and outside information. And then we are going to explain the efforts ad to address this constitutional or civic issue by individuals, groups, and or governments. Uh, and then we are going to discuss the extent to which these efforts were successful. Okay, we are looking at the, before we get into anything, we are looking at the government's role in the economy. Remember, they are going to give you, hand deliver to you, the topic that they want you to write about. So the constitutional or civic issue that they're talking about is the government's role in the economy. So we already know what the topic of all the documents are going to be. Uh, and so we just have to say, uh, we have to explain the efforts of the government in the economy. And then we have to say if it was successful or not. That's all they're saying. How did the government get involved in the economy? Were they successful or not? So when we look at this, uh, the question that we have here, how many paragraphs are we going to have? First, we're going to have an intro. This is going to be three to five sentences introducing the topic, which we already know is the government's role in the economy. Ooh, that is not right. Let's try to spell economy one more time. Economy. So what we might answer in here is time period. Uh, we're going to talk about, we're, we're literally going to say that we're going to talk about the government's role in the economy and then maybe the examples with the spelling today. Examples of how the government was involved or why. So how or why. Just introducing where you're going to go. Uh, your first paragraph, paragraph number one, is going to be your historical context. What information did you get from these documents to tell you what time period we're talking about? And you're going to want to use at least one to two documents in this part. Paragraph number two, how was the government involved? In the economy. You've got to give examples. What were they doing? Uh, what actions were taken? And again, at least one to two documents. Paragraph three was the government successful in helping the economy. And again, at least one to two documents. You want to make sure that you're answering all of the questions, and you did. We've got the historical context, which gives us the time period, uh, maybe what was happening 
happening in the country. You're going to use at least one to two documents. Paragraph two, how was the government getting involved in the economy? Paragraph three, was the government successful or not? That's your assessment. And then we always end with a conclusion. And that's going to be three to five sentences on, uh, you got to wrap it up. Wrap up, summarize, main. There's no E in main. Points. In conclusions, I like to say you take one sentences from each paragraph, you take your thesis from, or your claim from your introduction, you take a main idea from paragraph one, two, and three, and then you've got four sentences, you tie it off with one, you got a solid conclusion. This is not a repeat of your introduction. If you just copy down your introduction as your conclusion, then it's not a conclusion. It's another introduction. Does that make sense? I hope you're saying yes. Uh, so this is your basic outline for where you're going to go, uh, at what you would have for your civic literacy essay. Notice that it's a little bit different. You've got more paragraphs. They're going to be a little bit longer. You've got to reference more documents here. Uh, this is going to be a whole essay in comparison to those short essays. It's a little bit more complex. All right, let's take a peek at document one. If we look at the source here, the perils of prosperity, 1914 to 1932, we have just been given our time period. We know we're talking about the 1920s. They're going to ask you, according to the document, what is one example of unequal distribution of prosperity in the 1920s? Well, let's figure it out. Critics of big business in the 1920s emphasized not only the increase in concentration, but also the fact that the benefits of technology, technological innovations were by no means distributed. Corporate profits and dividends thus far outpaced the rise in wages, and despite the high productivity of the period, there was a disturbing amount of unemployment. At any given moment in the golden 20s, from 17 to 12 percent were jobless. Factory workers in sick or weak industries such as coal, leather, and textiles saw little of flash prosperous times, nor did blacks. In ghetto, in ghetto tenements or Hispanics in the foul burials of Los Angeles or El Paso or Native Americans abandoned it on desolate reservations. The Lorre Mill in Gastonia, North Carolina, site of a bloody strike in 1929, paid its workers that year a weekly wage of $18 to men, $9 to women for a 70-hour work week. That's crazy. Could you imagine working 70 hours and not even making a dollar an hour? Either way, at the height of Coolidge prosperity, the secretary of of Gastonia Chamber of Commerce boasted that children of 14 were permitted to work only 11 hours a day. Perhaps as many as 2 million boys and girls under 15 continue to toil in text mills. So you've got children working. Uh, in 1929, 71% of families had income under $2,500, generally thought to be the minimum standard of decent living. The 36,000 wealthiest families received as much as the 12,000 families, 42% of America, who received under 1,500 a year below the poverty line. One thing I want to point out is we've got some context here. Coolidge prosperity, that's President Coolidge, the Republican. When they say the height of Coolidge prosperity, they're talking about his presidency. Uh, and you've got a bunch of answers to look at from there. Good. Moving on to document two. When we look at the source again, we've got an excerpt from Hoover himself 
his re-election in 1932. So we know that this is after the crash. So we're going to write that down. After stock crash. We are in the Great Depression. We have been in the Great Depression uh, for three years at this point. Okay, so let's let's see what are they asking us based on the document. How does Hoover believe the American government can ensure progress for its people? So what should the government do is what they're asking us here. And I realize that in this time of distress, many of our people are asking whether our social and economic system is incapable of that great primary function of providing security and comfort of, of life to all the fires, firesides of 25 million homes in America, whether our social system provides for the fundamental development and progress of our people, whether our form of government is capable of originating and sustaining that security and progress. This question is is the basis upon which our opponents are appealing to the people in their fears and distress. They are proposing changes and so-called new deals which would destroy the very foundations of our American system. The American system is founded on the conception that only through ordered liberty, through freedom to the individual, and equal opportunity to the individual will his initiative and enterprise be summoned to spur the march of progress. So it, he's saying that the individual opportunity, the individual is the one that's going to do this for themselves. So what's the role of the government? There is none. He says it shouldn't be done. We shouldn't be involved. Remember from that reading that you had with Hoover, the self-reliant is how we are going to uh, get through this. Be self-reliant. Do it yourself. Take the initiative. Uh, the government's not going to do it for you. Okay, document 3A, we've got a chart. We're looking at unemployment uh, as a percentage of the labor force. We see the stock market is labeled here and then shortly, immediately, I shouldn't say that, after we see the highest spike in unemployment than we have in the past 30 years. Document 3B, we've got uh, New Deal programs. Uh, so we have, we've looked at the CCC here, we've got the AAA, we've got the National Industrial Recovery Act, National Recovery Administration, Public Works Administration. So we all know that each of these had to deal with jobs in the United States. And they are going to come from FDR's New Deal. So, one effect of the New Deal programs, if we go back up to the chart, we know FDR puts in place the New Deal, we start to see unemployment decline. So you can say jobs were given to Americans, unemployment decreased, however you want to put it. Document 4. If we look at our source here, we have FDR's second inaugural address, 1937. So we now know that the New Deal is in play. We know that he's been president for some time now, uh, and he's giving his second inaugural address, which means he was just reelected. So, how does Roosevelt believe the U.S. should measure its progress? He says, I see one-third of the nation ill-housed, ill-clad, ill-nourished. 
It is not in despair that I, po I paint you that picture. I paint it for you in hope, because the nation, seeing and understanding the injustice in it, proposes to paint it out. We are determined to make every American citizen the subject of this country's interest and concern, we, and we will never regard any faithful law-abiding citizen the subject of this country's interest and concern. And we will never regard any faithful law-abiding group within our borders as superfluous. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Today, we con recon reconsecrate our country to long-cherished ideals in a suddenly changed civilization, civilization, in every land there are always at work forces that drive men apart and forces that draw men together. In our personal ambitions, we are individualists, but in our speaking for in our seeking for economic and pro political progress as a nation, we all go up or else we all go down as one nation. So he says we should measure by how much we provide for those who have too little. Not by what we're doing to the top. The top is great, but we have to look at are we, are we doing enough for those who don't have enough. So he's saying pay attention to the bottom. This still, this one third that doesn't have housing, uh, that still doesn't have food, that still doesn't have jobs. Okay, 5A. Uh, we have historian Howard Zinn, an interview from the film The People Speak. And then we have a poster here that says 25,000 out in coast dock strike, textile walkout on September 1st planned. And if we look, this is 1934. And if we look here, this is also 1934. We're looking at what is one thing that influenced New Deal reforms. So let's go back up and read. What we learn in the schools is that when Franklin Roosevelt was elected, the New Deal came into being and saved the country from total collapse. In fact, Roosevelt's New Deal did take bold steps to alleviate the situation through Social Security, unemployment insurance, hiring millions of people to do useful work in a minimum wage. But what is often overlooked in history is of this period is that Roosevelt was pushed and pressured into the New Deal reforms by a nation in rebellion. There were strikes all over the country demanding change. As has happened again and again, the nation's history, the government was only moved to reform the actions of organized citizens. So, if we look at this, we reform by actions of organized citizens. So one thing that influenced, you've got strikes, you've got walkouts, you have uh, nations in rebellion, strikes all over. Uh, so the worker, what the worker demanded and how the worker demanded change also influenced New Deal reforms. All right, last document. If we look at the source, uh, we've got the Great Depression. Um, it, this is going to be a book on the Great Depression, and we're looking for one failure of the New Deal. Perhaps the most notorious failure of the New Deal to aid African Americans came with the passage of the Social Security Act. Southern politicians chafed at the prospect of African Americans benefiting from federally sponsored social welfare, afraid that economic security would allow black Southerners to escape the cycle of poverty. 
that kept them tied to the land as cheap, exploitable farm laborers, the Jackson, Mississippi Daily News callously warned that the average Mississippian can't imagine himself chipping in to pay pensions for able-bodied Negroes to sit around in idleness while cotton and corn crops are crying for workers. Roosevelt agreed to remove domestic workers and farm laborers from the pr provisions of the bill, excluding many African Americans, already laboring under the strictures of legal racial discrimination from the benefits of an expanding economic safety net. Women, too, failed to receive full benefits of the New Deal program. On one hand, Roosevelt included women in key positions within his administration, but many New Deal programs were built on the assumption that men would serve as breadwinners and women as mothers, homemakers, and consumers. New Deal social welfare programs tended to funnel women into means-tested state-administrated relief programs while reserving entitlement benefits for male workers, creating a kind of two-tiered social welfare state. And so, despite the great advances, the New Deal failed to challenge core inequalities that continued to mark life in the United States. One failure, you've got African Americans being excluded from Social Security. Uh, second failure, women not getting full benefits from the New Deal program. Two different ways to go at that one. All right, so historical context surrounding the issue in the government of the government's role uh, in the economy. Let's just go back up here. And we want, I like this one for historical context. I like this one for historical context. And I even like this one for historical context. So, if we look at these three documents and go back to our, we only need at least two. So, we might as well use document one and document two. The source of document one was the Perils of Prosperity, 1914 to 1932. So, if we go back a lot of flipping. Um, so this is going to be a book on perils of prosperity 1914 to 1932. So our setting then would be time leading up to Great Depression. And what else document one gives us? It tells us all the problems of the United States that were developing in the 1920s. That unequal distribution of wealth, the pay, um, uh, the unemployment, uh, so we can write those down as well. So unequal pay, increasing unemployment. We can write down uh, Coolidge presidency. He's a Republican, and if we remember, who did the Republican presidency support? And they supported big business, and if we remember the 1920s, business was America. 
So we would do anything to make sure that big business succeeded. Uh, and you can talk about uh, how they supported big business with the high tariff and the uh, hands off economics because that's what our Republican presidents did during the 1920s. They took that super hands-off approach to support big business, the growth of big business, and when that happens during the 1920s, that leads us to many of the problems of the 1930s. And if we look at document two, and we wanna do the source, that we remember was Hoover's uh, re-election campaign and that's going to be 1932 so remember we said we are in the Great Depression and we want to write down self-reliant which meant that the people would fix the economy on their own. That's that hands off government approach. He's saying the people should fix it. Remember, he tries to use trickle down economics where we give money to the wealthy. Remember, this does not work. Hoover's presidency proves that the, the Great Depression needed government involvement. He tries to take this hands-off approach and it doesn't work. This self-reliancy that the people going to work, being hard workers, would bring the nation out of this depression. It just plain and simple doesn't work. Uh, and those two documents are going to give you some context. What happened in the 1920s that led to the 1930s? That's really the question that you're trying to answer here. Uh, so you want to describe the 1920s. Uh, in your historical context because then we're going to take a turn of this to our second bullet point which is what were the efforts to to address this issue by individuals governments or groups so what did the government do to solve the great depression is really the question here. And we know that that's the New Deal. So we want to go and look at documents for the New Deal. So we want 3A and 3B for sure because those were our documents on the, the chart and then the New Deal. And then we are going to want document four because that's Roosevelt's second inaugural address and he's going to tell us what the nation's going through. So we want four as well. Who is the individual groups or government? That's going to be FDR, New Deal programs. And it shows the effect on unemployment. And what efforts were made? You've got the CCC, the AAA, you've got the WPA, and that's the works Progress Administration. You've got the W, oops, sorry, getting my letters all mixed up. The PWA, and uh, you also had the NRA on that one. So you could pick from the whole slew. These are all, you want to describe the new 
deal programs. And this is all, this is where you use 3A, and this is where you use 3B. Those documents are going to help you a ton, and your outside information is any of the programs that you can describe that were not on that list. And if I remember correctly, the WPA was not on that list, but the whole, the whole point here, what was the government doing? Giving people jobs. Those, those government-funded programs to give the people jobs. So if we look at document four, uh, the goal here is uh, who's the individual? Again, it's FDR. What efforts, uh, what was, and you want to mention that this is his second inaugural, oh, I'm not spelling inaugural address, right? That may still be wrong, but that's okay. Address. So again, it's FDR talking about uh, what was happening, what efforts were being made, uh, continued efforts being made to help those still suffering. Remember, his speech was about uh, we can't measure our progress just by the whole picture. We need to look at those who are still suffering because even when the nation as a whole looks like it's still doing well, we need to keep going. Keep going. Don't stop until everybody is saved. Were the efforts addressed to this issue by individuals, groups, or governments uh, successful? This is where your opinion comes into play. You tell me, do you think they were successful? Do you think they were not successful? And then prove it. What documents are you going to use to prove it? You can choose a couple of different ways to go about this. The last document, if you so choose to use it, Document six would tell you that no, because everybody was not helped. But you could look at document 3A again and say yes, unemployment went down. The people were employed. The, uh, the country as a whole started to do well. So it's really up to you if you want to say yes the government was successful or no, it was not successful. And it depends on which document you want to use. If you take the route of six, no, then you've got two ways the government failed. If you take document 3A, then you have uh, one surefire way that the government did succeed. So this last part is going to be on your own, your opinion. And, and that's the last real piece of this. You're not actually writing the essay. You are just going to give me this last piece on your own of your opinion. I hope this video helped. If you still have any questions going through this, please let me know. Shoot me an email.